5 verse 7, Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. You're going to love this because you've been wanting to say this anyway on my title, and I'm going to let you say it right now. And because I'm telling you to say it, you will have permission to say it. Look at the person next to you and, and tell them this, and tell them in a convincing way. Say, trust me, I'm trying. I'm trying. You may be seated. I promise I am. I really am trying. I know I don't always hit the mark, but I really am trying. Because for me, I have a rule, especially as a boss, um, the people that work for me, is that I always try to make it a point never to punish somebody who's trying to be proactive. I feel like if somebody makes a mistake because they took it a little too far, that's a little… Did you, did Jesus, Jesus let Peter cut Malchus's ear off in the garden and put it back on like Mr. Potato Head. But I think he liked Peter because Peter wouldn't just sit around. Peter was like, all right, I can, I can do something about this. The spirit is willing, the flesh is weak, and I'm about to use my flesh to cut off. And, and that's, that's a really interesting thing, isn't it? Now the kids will call somebody a tryhard. It's, it's, it's like a way of saying, you know, if, if it looks like you, you try, try too hard on your outfit. And I get that. But I like people who will give it a level of effort, and even if they miss, they swing so big. I've always liked people like that. I thought I should tell you this. If I ever come up here to preach and I don't do good, which I'm sure happens, it won't be because I didn't try. So if you ever see me up here struggling in this pulpit and you're like, I don't really understand this one. I think I see what he was trying to do. Did you catch that? Number one, it's probably your fault because you didn't pray enough before you came to church. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But trust me, I'm trying. And I think sometimes it can be frustrating when you are giving your best effort, but what is required of you is beyond your ability. And I'm going to try to ignore this fly buzzing around my head, but touch somebody and say, I'm trying. I'm I'm really trying. I'm really <laughs> you must have had to really trust Jesus to follow him when he walked the earth. People say, oh, I wish I could have followed Jesus and got, walked with him. You know, Now it's harder because God is not visible like that, and it would have been so cool. No, it wouldn't. It would have been so difficult to trust Jesus. And he was always getting in so much trouble. He was always explaining his actions and his intentions after the fact. And what that required from his disciples was just this crazy amount of trust. I'm trying. I'm really trying. <laughs> Whatever you do, just pray for me. Do them all. Do them all. Let's back up and see why he's feeling so feisty today. Sometime later, verse 1, John chapter 5, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now, there's in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, means house of mercy, and is surrounded by five covered colonnades or porches. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. It's important to note before I go on that this is a specific dwelling place for people with physical infirmities. And the reason I point that out is because I'm going to make some spiritual parallels to the physical infirmities that are mentioned in this passage. But I don't want us to miss the historicity for the sake of application. I think that would be irresponsible Bible teaching. The people who were at this particular hospital, if we can even call it that, it was more like a public service. This pool was not a resort pool. <laughs> Nobody is bringing you little umbrellas in your drink at this pool. This is a crowded pool, and it's pushing and shoving. And word has it 
that if you can get in the pool when the angel stirs the water intermittently, you can get healed. And this puts certain people who have certain disabilities at an advantage over others. For instance, it said there were the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. And so if you're a blind man by this pool, you can probably feel your way to the edge of the pool so that when there's an opportunity to get in and be healed, you'll be the first one there. But if you're paralyzed, it puts you at a disadvantage, because even if you get yourself to the edge of the pool, there's a chance that someone else can pull you back. You are powerless. And that's an interesting thing about life. I was out at the ball field uh, last baseball season, and I saw this really good dad with a fanny pack. He didn't look happy. <laughs> he didn't look like, you know, these are the days, making memories. He didn't look selfie ready. But you know what I liked about him? He was carting this wagon. He looked like he had some snacks for his kids. Or maybe he was on snack duty that day. And I just admired him because he was trying. I watched him pull that wagon up the hill. I thought about it how he was trying. He was sweating all through his shirt. You could tell he came straight from work. It wasn't a baseball shirt. He must have had the wagon that he packed the night before because he didn't have time to change the shirt, but he just came out there. Shirt was untucked on one side. Looked like he spilled a little something on the collar. And he was sweating through it, but he was trying. And I've always loved the scripture that says that Jesus looked at one man and he loved him. I thought about that a lot lately, how Jesus would show up to a place and look for somebody who was at a disadvantage. I kind of imagine him walking around the pool at Bethesda, and I'm sure his disciples were shocked that he would waste time with a bunch of people who they would call crippled. That's not a PC term, but that's how they would have put it. Sickness was connected to spiritual disorder in this time. Judaism in the first century made a strong connection between your spiritual condition and your physical condition. So like if you had money, that was a proof that you were living right. That's how they thought about it. We know that's not always the case. We know a lot of times some of the greatest people who are the most faithful to God, they might not live in a big house on earth, but we'll probably be cleaning their toilets in heaven for the treasure that they're storing up after this life. And yet there's this tendency to just judge things by the physical, always for all of us. So I kind of picture him, uh, Jesus walking around and asking questions. One interesting thing that's in the text, let me show you this real quick. It's too cool for me just to reference. I want to make sure it's very vivid. Yeah, it said, um, one who was there, verse 5, had been an invalid for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and learned. Now, what stood out to me about that text wasn't that Jesus saw him. What stood out to me about this text wasn't that the man had issues. We all have issues. And frankly, we all have areas of paralysis. And I'm going to talk about yours in seven minutes, so buckle in and get that judgmental look off your face, because I'm coming for you. On this particular occasion, what stood out to me is Jesus learned. I didn't think he could do that, because he's the image of God. He's the wisdom of God. How can the wisdom of God learn information? I figured that he must have been walking around asking, how about her? How long has she been here? Somebody said, well, uh, she just got here last week. Jesus said, nah, not her. How about him? How long has he been like that? That blind guy right there. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's recent. It's recent. It's been... It's been two months, I think. Two months? Two months? Jimmy, two months? Yeah, two months. Two months and three days. Yeah, two months and three days. No, no, no. Not him. How about that one? Three years. Eh, we'll see. Put him on standby. Because he's looking for somebody to heal. He's looking for somebody who can experience a miracle. He's looking for a platform to demonstrate his power. How about him? Five years. Eh. How about her? Seven. How about that guy? How long has he been like that? Nine years. Eh. 
getting closer. How about him? And finally, somebody figures out how they said, like, well, if you want somebody who's been here a while, I see what you're doing. 38 years. Long enough that he has given up hope that anything can ever be different. And Jesus learned that there was one. I'm going to try so hard not to cry when I say this to you. But verse 5 says, one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. What does it mean that Jesus, who only had three years to do ministry and was on his way to a feast, would come by for one? Does it mean, could it mean that out of everybody that I'm preaching to today, out of everybody that made a decision to show up at a campus, that God might want the one in the back who got here 12 minutes late, pulling a wagon, just trying to get through the week. Could it be that God is looking for the one who had the worst week, the worst upbringing, the one that other people said could never be anything, the one who has gotten so used to how it is? This is really what happens in life. You get so used to how it is that you cannot recognize that how it used to be is no longer what's in front of you. All right, so let's work on this a little bit. Bring him here, Jesus says. Now, when you get to heaven, you'll probably be shocked who's there and who's not. How many agree? There's going to be some people in heaven that are going to shock us. Like, whoa, she made it? That must have been like a thief on the cross deathbed kind of. She got in right under the wire. Whoa, they made it? I thought they believed weird stuff. They were new agey, and they made it? I think we're going to be surprised who's there and who's not. Because I think we're always surprised who God picks and who he uses and who he doesn't. One was there who had been lying there for so long that you can even tell in his response and the questions Jesus asked him that, that he, had, he had gotten tired of trying. My message today is for anybody who's tired of trying in an area of your life, tired of trying to repair a significant relationship, tired of trying to be open so that you can experience relationships, tired of trying to overcome the thing that you keep going back to, and it's been since you were even in your teens, and now you're a grown man. I edited it for YouTube, and now I'm tired of trying because there was a time where I tried to get people to help me to get into the pool, but now I found out that there's no one to help me. Now, what's mind-blowing about the situation at the pool at Bethesda is how many different ways I have heard this preached that completely contradict the heart of God. For instance, when Jesus comes up to the man and learned that he had been lying there and he had been in this condition for a long time, pause. How many of y'all have been in a certain condition for a long time? Jesus, I need help. There's three honest people in the church, and I forgot I was coming out to speak to the perfect saints, the 10 out of 10 A-plus saints. I forgot I was talking to the all-stars today. I thought I was coming to Elevation where they're not afraid to be real. In your name, amen. How many of y'all have had certain patterns of thinking that have been negative for a long time. I mean a long time. I don't know how old the man was, but 38 years, trust me, I'm 39, is a long time. This is the entire span of my natural life, and for so long he's been unable to move that now he cannot recognize the help that is standing right in front of him. And Jesus asks a question that I have often heard misinterpreted when he says, do you want to get well? Tone is everything. That's why you can't text every conversation, because tone is everything. Sometimes you need to pick up the phone and call people. 
because completely depending on the tone is how you see the heart of Jesus. I always read it for a long time like Jesus said, do you want to get well? I almost see him now like he's got something in his back pocket and he's sneaking around the pool looking for somebody. They say God helps those who help themselves, but I almost see Jesus looking for somebody who can't and he's like, I see you caught in the situation. You want to get well? And the man has every reason to be suspicious. Can you imagine how many people have taken advantage of him in almost 40 years of suffering? How many hustlers have come through the pool at Bethesda trying to sell a magic potion or some bubbling water? Hey, I got some cream, man. Put it on your legs. I promise it's blessed. Hey, man, I promise you, I'll bring you to the pool. I'll push you in when the water starts bubbling. Just give me half now and half after the move. I promise you, I can carry you in. I got you. How many times did somebody make him a promise? Because it seems cruel that Christ, the expression of the love of God, would stand over a man who couldn't move and ask him such a ridiculous question. Do you want to lose weight? <laughs> well, yeah. Do you, do you want to be happy? Well, yeah. Do you want to be able to live at peace without anxiety? Well, yeah. What you selling? I heard this spiel before. I tried that diet. How many of y'all tried that diet before? I put a meditation app on my phone. Y'all, to be honest with you, I got four meditation apps on my phone. I tried all of them. I either fall asleep or my leg starts doing like that. I can't do it. Everybody tells me to meditate. The Bible says meditate. Russell Brand says meditate. Joe Rogan says meditate. Everybody's telling me to meditate. I tried it. I really did try it. They also taught me about portion control. I tried portion control. How many of y'all tried? Somebody told me one time, they said, here's how, you, here's how you stay at an ideal weight. When you're full, stop eating. My only problem, I never found full. <laughs> that gauge got broken somewhere in my childhood. I never felt full, so I kept eating. I tried that. Oh, they say if you don't complain, you will feel more connected to God. I tried it, but I found out sometimes if you don't complain, nothing changes. I tried so hard not to complain. I, one time, I was going to go seven days without complaining, and I thought if I could do it, I could make a sermon out of it. I thought I could call it, you know, seven days, a week of worship or something like that. I tried so hard not to complain for seven days. What happened was... <laughs> And this is so embarrassing to admit to you. The more I tried not to complain externally, because sometimes you can fix the symptom. Now I'm in the text. You can fix the symptom and stop trying to complain, but the root of it, what happened to me was, I went five good days without complaining, but on day six, the walls of Jericho came tumbling down a day early. Everything in my path was, oh, it was a tornado. It was a downpour. Because when you fix the symptom but don't address the system that created the symptom, the end is worse than the beginning. You want to get well? Well, yeah. I'm trying. When you get to heaven, you'd be surprised who's there and who's not. But one thing you might really be shocked about, this dude, whoever he is in John 5, is going to have a long line of preachers waiting to apologize to him for how we misinterpreted his story in John chapter 5. Oh, I've heard everything. I've heard it said that in 38 years, the man should have been able to crawl or roll his way to the edge of the pool. Yeah, like that would work. 
because now somebody stronger than you is just going to pull you back. At the moment, you're still powerless to fall in at the right time. And besides, when has Jesus ever taunted someone into transformation? You really think that's the spirit of the Savior? Some of us do. We really picture God like standing over us in our minds, our concept of God like, you don't want it bad enough. If you would have done it different when they were eight, they wouldn't have been in so much trouble when they were 18. See? You screwed them up. That's what God sounds like to a lot of us. So it's no surprise that when we hear Jesus say, Do you want to get well? He says it with a snarl, you know? Do you even want to get well? Do you even lift? Are you even serious? I mean, prove it if you do. If you want to get well, say, I want to get well. So why did he ask it? Why did he ask the man, do you want to get well, before he helped him get up and walk? And as I prayed through that this week, I realized that before Jesus could help him walk, he had to help him want. I don't know who this is for, but God is dealing with your desires in this season of your life. You have been disappointed over and over and over again. And every time you try, nobody notices. And every time you try, you come up short. Sickness is cyclical. It comes around, it goes around. You're well for a little while, and then it's the same thing all over again, but this time it's only worse. Because now, not only are you back where you started, but you have less hope that it is ever going to be different because you've cycled through it one more time just to realize, well, I guess I'm just a cynical person. Well, I guess I'm just a negative person. I guess nobody in my family was meant to go to college. I guess, see, when you hang around the colonnades with people who are sick, sickness becomes normal to you. And it starts to be easier for you to just accept the condition than to challenge it. Because to challenge the condition means to risk disappointment. And some of us have tried, got blocked. Tried, got blocked. Tried, got blocked. And now people see you and they assume that you don't care. No, I care. I cared, and I cared so much, but they didn't care back. And I tried so hard, and I still got looked over. And don't you know it's hard when your expectation has been damaged by disappointment? It's a slow damage. It's a slow tearing of the muscle fibers. It's a slow deterioration of your hope by disappointment. It is not one event that creates it. It's over and over. I tried, and I tried, and I smiled, and I stayed. Stayed, and I cooked and I parented and I disciplined and I showed up and I didn't care and, and the man has finally gotten to a place I believe where he is tired of trying are you it's our game changer offering this offering goes toward expansion and outreach and ministries just like this and we're calling on our efam that's what we call our extended family all around the world I know I love it it's so exciting that people join us every single